25 minutes or less. Assessment for learning is of course assessment of learning. Okay, so it's a bit of a, a change where we're kind of flipping it on its side, flipping it on its head really, I suppose, where we're looking at assessment as a way of learning as opposed to just uh, how the students have got this information to head not. So getting to do an assessment that would actually promote and enhance their learning. And hopefully, as we're talking about technology, we're going to try to do the technology in this kind of learning cycle. We're going to look at some examples, some case studies, and we're going to be doing some activities ourselves nice and sheet ahead of there for you guys. Okay, we're going to have lots of discussion and chat. Okay, so this is Prezi and it broke my heart this morning. So fingers crossed it will actually work. Okay, so just a quick review of the literature to show you where we're at and what we're at. Um, so you probably have experienced this yourself. I don't know what kind of background you guys come from, who's teaching, who's not teaching, for level or whatever. But uh, you probably all have been in this situation yourselves at some stage where you're a disengaged and apathetic student. You don't really care. You're sitting there, you're going to this class, everyone aims. Uh, you know, treat it like it's the same. You sit back, a big lecture hall, look up at the front, there's something going on in the front, you're not really that interested in it. So you're consuming the knowledge, you're not producing the knowledge. Okay, so we're trying to move from the idea of having students be students as consumers, and we go through this little journey, and we end up with students as producers, which is the opposite end of the spectrum where we're getting to produce knowledge. Okay, so it's not the kind of copy and paste Wikipedia that is rampant in my college, but you know, actually getting in there, synthesizing, theorizing, you know, the hierarchy and skills that you guys have been more than familiar with. So we're going from this idea of disengaged and applied students. And this guy here, Biggs, I'm sure you've been chatting about him in class. Um, he seems to have a great life in retirement. This is him. I went to his website there uh, when he's getting his Prezi resi ready. Um, and he's on a great variety of reef, snorkeling, and all that kind of stuff. So he's enjoying retirement. But one of the key things that came out of his work was the idea that learning cannot be transmitted by direct instruction. Okay, so us talking is not really going to get things to go on people's heads and people understand it. It's created by learning activities. Okay, so that's why we're going to be doing activities today. Okay, so you do something in class. You, you, you put the knowledge to practice, you put it into action, and then you can understand it a little bit better. So basically what he's saying is, you have to get active. Okay, there's no point in sitting in a classroom, uh, you need to be using the information, put it into practice, and, and get busy. So this thing's in there, the two other ideas. Cousins, um, she writes a lot about, Glenn's cousins, she writes a lot about kind of these ideas of threshold concepts. It's like a hurdle. Okay, so once you get over the hurdle, you get it. Okay, it's like when you ride a bike, you fall off a few times, and once you ride a bike, you figure out how to ride a bike, Ride a bike forever, you never forget how to ride a bike. So, the idea of a threshold concept is you know, something in the way, but once you get over it, you go, oh yeah, you get it. like the aha moment that the previous speaker spoke about inside. So, once you get it, you got it for good. Okay? Another idea is Brunner um, and a spiral curriculum. Okay, so this idea is you're kind of drilling down, you come back up, you're taking a kind of a helicopter view, you're drilling down again, you're getting a little bit deeper, you understand a bit more, you come back out again, you're going a little bit further. So, it's that constant tuning, flowing, and little hurdles every time makes you kind of get things a little bit better. And activities are a great way of kind of getting people to, first of all, realize that there is a hurdle, get over the hurdle, and then that constant backwards and forward uh, motion is, is going to improve their understanding as well. So kind of two ends of the spectrum, 1966 and 2006, but the two of them kind of do kind of come together. So another thing that was a problem in my classroom is these kids most gadgets, okay, the classroom is full of them, everyone, we're using them today. Uh, everybody is all fair with technology, okay, they're tweeting, they're texting, they're Facebook and all at the same time, we're still trying to listen to me. So why not talk about the big elephant in the room? Just say, right, let's use the technology. Let's get them enhancing their learning through the use of technology in something they're comfortable with. And hopefully then, get them to be Steven Spielberg's, okay? So producer of the knowledge, okay? So to go from that idea of student as consumer to these active and enthusiastic students because they're the ones that are making their learning come to life. They're the ones that are producing knowledge. Okay? It's not me trying to fill their head with information. It's me trying to kind of, you know, ignite the spark, I suppose. So on a more practical level, this lad, this lad Michael Neary, um, was at a talk in Galway a couple of years ago, and uh, he kind of just said something stuck in my head, the aha, aha moment for me, when he talked about the student as producer. Okay, so his philosophy was that you need to get students engaged in real life, complex and unstructured research-like activities. Okay, don't give them the answer. Don't tell them, you know, there's only one answer to this question. Let them be open, let them, you know, you know flounder around, but let them get that hurdle, stand back and try and jump over, figure a way of getting over that hurdle. It has to be real life, to make it authentic. There's no point getting to do an assessment that is not related to what they're going to be doing when they finish. And have it, you know, research like where they're the kind of ones that are deciding where they're going to go, how they're going to go there, and what the end point is going to be. So, student engagement, that's what I want to do, try and get students engaged. If you look at the literature, kind of common things come up is need, desire, want to take part, compulsion to take part, compulsion to partake. Often people say if you have higher order thinking processes in your activities, that equals engagement. What I think is you need active higher order thinking processes to get engagement. 
So we're talking about actual learning, peer enhanced learning, which is what you're going to be doing today, uh, and aligning all this to user generated objects. So you have something produced at the end of the day. So there's a whole point of it. At the end of the day, you go from the bank sheet to having something. Okay, whether it's a video, whether it's a mind map, whatever it is, you have something to show. Well, look, this is my work. I've learned from the bank sheet where I knew nothing, and now it produces visual, in my case, asset that I can show people what I've learned and how I've learned. And this is the appendix assessment for learning. So what we're going to have today, we're going to have shooting that's produced with pedagogies. Okay, so just four things I just picked up the top of my head. These are kind of things I'd use in class. Twitter, peer wise, mind maps, and video. Okay, so I know there's a class of mind maps I didn't know about that at the time, so we're going to quickly quick, quick, skip through that. Twitter, did anyone use Twitter in class? Yeah, I, I um, just started taking my notes, tweeting them, and then storifying them later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great way to use Twitter in class, yeah? Yeah, I use it for um, adults in community education for, I'll post the links and information, and then they have to cling, click on the links to direct where they want to go into the sites so and then come back and... Well. You yeah, the and then they have to click back in and review the sites they visited as part of their internet class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm kind of getting into it. Kind of for a while, I was standing back on this Twitter just to be conveyor belt information. It's just flying by me. But if you use it properly, it does give you, you know, a lot of a lot of these things. I can't vouch. I got ideas from Twitter, so it's, it's personal learning that one for me. Peerwise, anyone ever use Peerwise? We want to break back with that in. Mind maps, we're going to. Skip all that quick in a video, that's what I'm going to do in my last round at the moment, so we'll do a little bit of that to show you some, some case studies from the work that students are doing for me. So Twitter is, for those who don't know, it's a combination of personal publishing and communication. Okay, so it's like little micro text messages, I suppose, that you know, I want to see. So users tweet not only to deliver information, so in your case, giving information out, you know, storing all that information, but also to ask questions. Okay, so say if you're stuck, does anyone have a good software for doing this, that, or there? Put a tweet out and you'd be surprised if you how many people respond to you. Six four for validated ideas. Okay, so that was kind of the academic side of Twitter, I suppose. So here's what I kind of do in class sometimes. So first one, uh, write a tweet, which is 160 characters less, to summarize a topic on the notes you've done today, and then send it out to the class and follow each other so you can kind of see as a way of everyone having a chat with everyone over coffee that we do in class here, but you know, on a much bigger scale for you know my class course should be 200 students. So it's a way of 200 students summarizing a topic that everyone else can read. So it's a quick way for them to kind of recap. Facebook, again, kind of in the social media realm. Um, at, this, at this stage, I was kind of deciding whether to have a Facebook page for the class or not. I kind of decided against it because, for a number of reasons, mainly because the students want to have Facebook as their personal space, I suppose, for you know, whatever they do inside like college. And then, you know, they have other things inside college, like the web course and whatever. So, for example, again, just kind of get them thinking about it in, in the, an outside the classroom world. Write a Facebook status for an organic chemistry molecule. Okay, so I'm an organic chemistry lecturer, so uh, think like the molecule, I suppose, and write a status on it. Okay, so you're writing a status for carboxyl groups and so backside is because there's a reaction where it attacks it from the rear. And the students find that quite funny, so it's a good way of looking real life into the Twitter sphere, I suppose. So, common activity, so again, I mentioned through the here today. So, sharing information, seeking information, and community building. So, for me, community building is probably the most important use of Twitter where I can actually get ideas from. All around the world, particularly Australia, America is quite strong in the tech side of education. Um, but quite interestingly, these are the same things that people are doing in Twitter regularly. Okay, so if you're following them, like, you know, um, Stephen Clay, he's a quite funny person to follow on Twitter. He could probably break out his tweets into one of these three categories as well. So what we're doing in academia is kind of mimicking the real world as well, which is what I, I kind of find more interesting. So that's Twitter we use, so some examples, we've chatted about them here already, Twitter based fora, and do any people follow Twitter fora? There's a good one, EdTech IE, it's on Tuesday evenings for an hour, and it's just basically, there's a, a topic selected every week, and uh, everyone logs in, uses the hashtag to communicate with each other, and so, you know, topics range from um, new junior shirt, you know, the reform of junior shirt to uh, use of technology and education, and everything in between. So it's a good way to kind of get, and um, you know, get to know the people that are tweeting in our area first of all, people that you'd like to follow that would be you know, helpful for you. There's no point in following a thousand people and just rings and rings and rings of tweets. Pick you know, 5, 10, 15 people that you know will have good quality tweets um, every so often. An online DTP, um, again, it's something you could do to try and get the class to engage with each other if you have an online or blended class where you get them to have a chat to each other via Twitter or follow a person via Twitter and then come together, kind of like what you were saying, we have your notes and you kind of compile them putting people's tweets together and saying, well, is this guy an, an important guy in the field? Is this guy an important uh, world leader in the area of whatever, adult education? Notification communication, we had that already today. 
Um, so it's, it's a good way to get information usually like that, send it out to the class. The le lecture pattern has changed, we're in X104 now. Okay, so it's quicker than getting. And it's also a way if you're you know, kind of coming across things that are interesting in your reading or in, in your research, you can send that to the students with a little hyperlink and they can follow it if they want. Okay, so it's kind of extra reading that they can kind of get on the fly, read it on the bus, on the train, on the way home, kind of, you know, keep them occupied with those and nothing else. And it's a good way to disseminate your work as well. So if you are publishing in the area, say, you know, paper on, conference proceedings on, here's my latest work. And it's a good way for you to get followers and kind of enhance your learning network as well. So, as I said before, the best way to get us to learn as students in the classroom here today is to get active. So on your worksheet there you have activity number one. So those four things that I just mentioned there. So pick one of those four, take a look at it, and see would you get adapt it or apply it in your own teaching or your own training. three or four minutes on the sheet to two or three minutes because we were a little bit short on time. So just pick one, have a ratio, see. Does that work for me or that 